Good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody to the 2021 launch of the Economic Freedom of the World uh, report hosted by the Free Market Foundation. Um, my name is Neil Emmerich. I, I'm a director of Knightsbridge and an associate of the Free Market Foundation. I've also been involved with the Economic Freedom of the World report for the last 18 years, producing a software version of the data. Now, We'll start uh, this morning by just explaining what the Economic Freedom of the World Report is, and obviously we will be releasing the uh, this year's data. And it should be understood, this is a 25-year project, and it poses and tries to answer the question, what is economic freedom? Now, that might be uh, sound like an easy problem, but it can actually be more challenging to define. Uh, if we were to take a question, for example, like, um, you know, happy people are more generous. How would we define what happiness is and how would we define what generous is? We have the same sort of problem with defining economic freedom. And what we want to know is do countries that follow economic freedom and the policies that support it do better than those that do not? So this, this question was raised by uh, Milton and Rose Friedman and Michael Walker from the Fraser Institute in 1996. And they wanted to answer the question, how do you formally compare countries? And how can you judge public policy and institutional performance? Now, first and foremost, they wanted to define economic freedom along classical liberal lines. So these are supported by the pillars of personal choice, voluntary exchange, free markets, and the security of person and property. What they came up with after a series of meetings and consultations with Nobel laureates was an academic project that attempts to find a way of statistically recognizing what economic freedom is. And today we have the Economic Freedom of the World Report. It's published each year by the Fraser Institute and the Free Market Foundation is involved in each year as a, as a, a friend of the Fraser Institute. Um, the report itself then is an analysis of policy and it's comprised of uh, other reports. So it is a report of reports. Its data is mostly objective, although it does rely on some subjective reports. And the composition of the index itself is transparent. Now, this is important because it does mean that other academics can try altering the weights and try and produce different results. Uh, but over the years, they found that the current composition, which is a neutral composition, um, has, has really uh, supported uh, its function, which is um, capturing the essence of economic freedom. The key elements to the report are five areas, and we have speakers today addressing four of those, going into a little bit more detail. Um, those areas are, uh, one, the size of government. Um, it answers the question whether if a government was to tax 100% of your money, uh, you certainly would not be economically free. Um, to have no tax, no government uh, would be ultimately economically free. Um, and then we have area two, which is the security of person and property rights. Uh, we will be exploring that in more detail, very relevant to South Africa. Area three is sound money. Um, a country cannot exist without a secure currency to depend on. And then we have in area four, uh, freedom to trade. Um, we live in a global world and uh, we can measure our ability to engage with that world. And then area five is quite a a substantial category, it measures regulation and red tape, and we can see to what degree businesses and labour um, are regulated within a given economy. Now, a couple of years ago, there was a correction, uh, not a correction, um, a change in methodology to the report, uh, whereby a, a gender coefficient was introduced in the area, area two, which is the secure property rights. Sadly, around the world, uh, women are not allowed to engage in the economy in the same way that men are. And this unfairly ranked some countries that prejudiced their women um, and, and gave them a, a higher ranking in the index than was deserved. So a couple of years ago, they introduced the gender coefficient, which uses a, a particular survey by the um, uh, World Bank that measures to what degree women are allowed to own property, engage in business, be a director, uh, have to rely on their husband for the transfer of property and so on. And this gender coefficient is then, um, uh, or rather the area to score is halved and multiplied by the gender coefficient. So those countries that do particularly poorly 
uh, by not granting their women equal rights, will then get a correspondingly lower Area 2 score. Now, since the Economic Freedom of the World report has been um, put out there, uh, a number of academic papers have based their uh, reports on their studies using the Economic Freedom Index as a variable in their report. And in 2014, the author, uh, Dr. Robert Lawson and uh, uh, Hall produced a survey of the literature and they found over 600 reports that used the Economic Freedom of the World Index. So it's um, cited in, in very, very many uh, academic reports and the results are overwhelming. Um, the simple conclusion is that the more economic freedom that you have, the more of everything else that is desirable you are likely to have. That includes uh, longevity, better healthcare, better education, better wealth. Um, that is quite stark in the income levels of various countries. So if we split the world into quartiles, we see that the upper quartile earns something like $50,000 a year, where the lower quartile will earn something like $5,000 a year. So there is a 10x difference between the first quartile and the fourth quartile. The Importantly, the poor in the first quartile earn something like $14,000 per year. In the bottom quartile, they would earn $1.5,000 a year. Again, that's sort of an eight to 10 times difference. So if you're going to be poor, you'd want to be poor in an economically free country. If you live in an economically free country in the top quartile, you're likely to live to 81 years old. Living in the bottom quartile, you'd be lucky to hit 66. These things matter. One criticism of economic freedom leveled unfairly is one of income inequality. Um, the claim would be that economic freedom, the higher levels of economic freedom would create higher levels of inequality. And that's not borne out by the statistics. Um, the lowest uh, percentage of the uh, income levels in all of the different streams is around two and a half percent for extreme poverty. And that's spread evenly across uh, economically free countries and economically unfree countries. So inequality is not explained by economic freedom. Now, we move on to this year's report. Uh, the uh, number of countries uh, this year has been increased by three, and we now have 165 jurisdictions in the report. And uh, the report um, also this year is notable for including a chapter um, from a South African. The global report includes that. That hasn't been done for 18 years, that's so quite an honour. Uh, 18 years ago, I had the honour of uh, producing a chapter based on the software that I'd produced. And this year, we look to Martin van Staden at the Free Market Foundation, who has produced a very important chapter on expropriation without compensation. So I do draw your attention to that. Moving on to the results, uh, South Africa uh, is placed 84 again, uh, almost level with Nigeria as a country. Um, this is almost exactly in the middle of the global um, rankings. So South Africa would appear to be a very sort of mediocre average country. Although I think what is important here is that the trend is important rather than our current position. And unfortunately, South Africa does appear to be on a slide. The top 10 countries are Hong Kong, Switzerland, New Zealand, uh, Georgia, the US, Ireland, Lithuania, Australia, and Denmark. Overall, we can say that world economic freedom has increased this year. That is good news. Uh, our neighbours um, are Botswana at 45, that's the highest ranking, Namibia at 95, Eswatini at 136, Lesotho at 112, and Zimbabwe at 161. So South Africa does not sit in a particularly good neighbourhood or a particularly free neighbourhood. So South Africa should reconsider its current policies. Uh, we have a, one of the worst labour statistics in the report uh, in the world, and correspondingly, we have the worst unemployment in the world. We definitely as a country need to look at the report and recognise what it is telling us. We should look at the expropriation of uh, property. We had water rights and mineral rights expropriated previously, and now our government is considering the expropriation without compensation of land. We have relatively high inflation. We are considering policies of localization, of protectionism, when we should be looking at free trade in Africa. 
Our government is in crisis and they are desperately in need of ideas. So we hope today that this report offers more evidence that pursuing different policies would actually lead to better results.